Welcome to our adult Sabbath school lesson study. This quarter, we're studying the book of Mark, and we are at lesson number two. Our lesson for today is entitled, A Day in the Ministry of Jesus. The memory text for this week is taken from Mark chapter 1, verse 17, and it reads, Then Jesus said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. I will read again, Mark 1, 17. It reads, Then Jesus said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Let us bow our heads in prayer. A loving and merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings you've given us, and thank you for the privilege of allowing us to meditate on this gospel. May we be able to understand the truth through your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you read through the Gospels, you will realize that the Gospels are interesting. One of the ways the, the Gospels are interesting is that each Gospel has a, an account of Jesus' life that is a bit different. Sometimes they're narrating the same event, but Either Gospels leave items out or they include information that even seems to contradict. Although some people who are critical about the Bible might complain about these and say that, aha, this proves that the Bible is untrue. The fact that there are contradictions in the, in the narrative indicate that it probably is true because eyewitness accounts in one way or the other, seem to contradict even today. Our lesson for today has many themes, and the themes are as follows. First, follow me, and an unforgettable worship service, more Sabbath ministry, the secret of Jesus' ministry, and can you keep a secret? If you look at our lesson for this week, the lesson begins with these ideas. It talks about how each of the Gospels begin. The Gospels begin, especially about Jesus' ministry, in a different way. The Gospel of Matthew begins Jesus' ministry by introducing him uh, as giving the Sermon on the Mount, preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Luke talks about Jesus as preaching his first sermon uh, on the Sabbath in the synagogue at Nazareth. We find John beginning, uh, John recalling the beginning of his ministry as the first miracle that he did at the wedding at Cana. And this was also an indication of Jesus as the Messiah. And for us here, the Gospel of Mark recounts the calling of the four disciples and describes a Sabbath in Capernaum and what followed. And that is in, it is interesting to consider that this is how Mark decided to begin the gospel. Another interesting fact that the lesson tries to point out is the phrase or, or the term immediately. You'll find immediately sprinkled all over the book. And it's interesting that it is present in that way. You don't find this in any other of the Gospels. And this is probably the reason why it might be there. It's said that Jesus is portrayed in Mark's Gospel as performing one action after another. The Greek word, euthus, translated as immediately, at once, or suddenly, in English, is found 50 in 51 verses in the four Gospels and in Mark 41 times. So this says that, yeah, immediately might be there in many of the other Gospels, but it predominantly is present in Mark, and that's what is unusual. And it seems like Mark is trying to portray Jesus as someone who is in action, who is always active, is going from one work to the other who is always ready to do the work of God. As you can see how last week we saw how um, 
Jesus was led by the Spirit with force. So it seemed like Jesus is always on a mission. Coming to the part of our lesson, this famous phrase, follow me, is said when Jesus is passing by the Sea of Galilee and he finds a few people there. First, Peter and Andrew are introduced. And later on, we find that James and John are also introduced into the scene. Jesus first calls Peter and Andrew, and both of them leave their nets and they follow Jesus. And Jesus also calls James and John, but the description that is given of, between both of these uh, couples is a bit different. When it comes to Peter and Andrew, not much is given about what they're doing and what they have. And this probably indicates that they did not have very much. And James and John, on the other hand, seems to have, uh, like, they seems like their father has a whole team there to help and to take care of their business. And Jesus calls both of these groups and they come and follow. Now, one good thing to consider when we are reading the Gospels any gospel is to look at other gospels if there are any things that we can learn. And we know that James and John and Andrew, they're all introduced in the book of John. As Jesus uh, goes into the wilderness and comes back, and John then points out to Jesus saying, this is the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. These people follow and want to be his disciples. Although this is not mentioned here, and there's good reason for Mark not to mention it, it is interesting to see how the events flow and how Jesus then is able to call these people. And one interesting thing that Mark tries to emphasize here is that they immediately responded to the call of Jesus, whether they were well-to-do or whether they had almost nothing. It seems like they had enough reason to believe and to trust that Jesus was the Messiah, and they gave their lives to Jesus. And later on, we read that there are many times when the disciples exclaim that uh, they left everything and what is there for them. And ultimately, at the end of Jesus' life, when he died and resurrected, they re realize what Jesus had actually given them and the treasure of relationship and experience they had with Jesus. But it's interesting to see that these disciples, when they did not know too much about Jesus, were willing to follow with just a little knowledge about who Jesus was or what he was able to do. So a question that we can ask is, what have you left to have Jesus? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Because in some way, Jesus has to be ours. He has to belong to us in a way to say that is Jesus precious to us? Is he something that we, is he someone that we cherish? Like when we have a friend or even say, for example, uh, a married couple, they cherish each other. In fact, they belong to each other. In a similar way, God wants to have a relationship with us where we belong to him and he belongs to us in a way. So what have you left? to have Jesus. Sometimes we don't need to leave too much because all of these can be used by God. But there are other times when we really need to leave some things. It may be even legitimate things, just like how Abraham did. But like the example here that Mark shows, many of the disciples, or at least the fishermen disciples, they left everything immediately to follow their Messiah. The story then moves forward to a Sabbath worship where the disciples along with Jesus are there in the synagogue and they're worshiping uh, on the Sabbath. And at that time, we find that a demon-possessed person comes to, to worship and then causes a ruckus. It's very interesting to find a demon-possessed person in the synagogue. Synagogue was a place where they, people re received religious instruction, and it was something 
that where uh, some place where people used to worship it it was a very later addition to the jewish life uh and but by the time of jesus synagogues existed in many places where the jews were to find a demon possessed person in the synagogue on the sabbath is a very interesting uh, combination and we when we read the story we see that this demon possessed person uh, speaks about Jesus and calls Jesus the Holy One of God. And the demon does show some kind of indication that he does not like the presence of Jesus there. But it's interesting that as Jesus interacts with the demon-possessed man, he commands the demon to be silent. And this is an interesting theme that you find in many uh, of the instances where Jesus performed miracles, he wants either the people or here in this case, the demons to be silent. And so a question that is asked by the lesson is what does it mean to be prudent in witnessing present truth? Because here the lesson tries to point out that yes, it is true that the demon proclaimed Jesus to be uh, the Holy One of God. And we find even in the book of Acts example, like where, Paul and Silas uh, healed or cast out a demon from a woman, although she was really telling the truth. So we can understand it is not just simply about affirming or speaking the truth, but even the way we deliver the truth is important. And the timing in which truth is delivered is also important. All of these factors need to be taken into consideration. All well, the truth is is. I mean, truth is objective. It's important for us to recognize when to speak and when not to speak, when to introduce a subject and when not to, because not everyone is ready to understand and accept truths. And when truth is shared in the right way, people will be able to listen and accept what is true. So here in this case, the Jews were not really ready to accept Jesus as the Messiah. So if anyone was there around just simply blabbering things, they would just not accept him as a Messiah and so on. The lesson also tries to point out that throughout the ministry of Jesus, there were demon-possessed uh, people that were present and that affected the ministry of Jesus. And these are the three, three points that the lesson indicates. First of all, that evil is present from the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Second, that demons could recognize what the masters of Israel did not recognize in relation to Jesus and his identity. And thirdly, Jesus always overcame the demons. And that is an important thing to consider. Jesus overcame demons, which means that any evil force that we might need to experience or might need to face is not something that we have to be afraid about because Jesus has power over everything. Jesus has power and control over demons. And we know that in the New Testament, his disciples also were able to have power over demons. Even during the time when Jesus was on this earth, he gave power to cast out demons, even to the likes of his disciples like Judas. And so Jesus has power over demons. But as we think about casting out demons, it's important for us to understand how to do it in the right way. It is important to observe how Jesus casts out demons and do it exactly that way and not try to presume upon God. There are many people who have written many books that have many different strategies of how to cast out demons. Some say you have to go into the person's past and recall when the demon entered in the person and then cast them out that way. Or you're in some way or the other have some sort of conversation with the demon. But here in this case, Jesus just asked the demon to be quiet. So what is important is that we have a prayerful, strong relationship with God. Jesus even emphasizes this uh, in, in his ministry when he talks to disciples and says that with much prayer, 
these things can happen by casting out demons. So let us not think about fanciful things. Some people, for example, carry a Bible and put it on people's head and cast out demons that way, or talk to demon and say, you need to go out and maybe touch this branch or break this branch. And that way we know that you have left. These are, are all things that are not recorded in the Bible as indications of whether a demon has left or not. What we know is that Christ has power over demons. And if we just simply trust God and pray, that is enough. That is the only responsibility we have. No other magic power, no other holy water or salt or whatever. None of these things in the Bible have been used to cast out demons. And so let us follow the example that is in the Bible and just trust Jesus and prayerfully help those who are in need. After a big turmoil that happened there in the synagogue, the disciples come to Peter's house and there's another incident that happens. We find Peter's mother-in-law sick on the bed. And Jesus here administers to Peter's mother-in-law and heals her. And after she gets healed, she ministers to Jesus and the disciples. It's important to note that Peter was married. And so some people have certain traditions about Peter being the first pope and so on. Of course, they may have their reasons, but it's important to recognize that Peter was married and not celibate. Nevertheless, we see that Jesus cares for his disciples' family. Although he asks them to leave and follow him, he does care for them. And interestingly, after a while, after the Sabbath, it's important, after the Sabbath, Jesus begins healing more people, casting out more demons and healing the sick again. When we think about this part of the story, we can ponder upon, meditate upon the compassion that Jesus had for people. He could have said, ah, I'm tired today. I had enough for today. And many, if many people have gone, for example, to medical camps uh, in more remote places, where they do not have good health care. Many have experienced long lines for just simple treatment. And they have spent like a whole day treating people one after the other. And of course, Jesus also would have had a similar experience because this went on until the night. And, after it, and he went through everyone and cared for all of the people who came to the house. And this also tells something about the disciples. They were willing, or Peter, for example, Peter and his family were willing to accommodate Jesus and his ministry. But what is more interesting than all of these things that Jesus was able to do, like cast out demons or heal the people, is his source of power. The secret of Jesus' ministry. As Mark recalls, the ministry of or recounts the, the life of Jesus, we find that he notes that Jesus rose up early in the morning, even before like the sun rose, and went to a remote location or desert and deserted location to pray. That's important for us to note. And why? Because Jesus had a long day the previous and even it kind of probably went into the night and he didn't care about that. He needed to spend time with his father. So he went and he spent time in secret, not just simply corporately. He spent time alone with God. Do you have time that you spend alone with God? Uh, especially at the beginning of the day, to gain power from God. Interestingly, in Luke 6, also we find Jesus again spending time with God 
And sometimes he spent time with God sending his disciples away. He spent time with God alone. He spent time with God throughout the night. So when we think about, oh, Jesus did all of these wonderful things. He did all of these powerful miracles. An important thing to note is that he had a very interesting prayer life. There are many prayers that are recorded in the Bible. One of these is John chapter 17. A very beautiful prayer indeed. And one interesting thing you find also is that one of the things the disciples asked Jesus to teach them was not how to preach, was not how to heal, but it was how to pray. So a question that we can ask is what does the prayer life of Jesus tell us about how we need to pray? Of course, we have heard this many times that Jesus prayed a lot and so we need to pray. But the, the prayer that Jesus prayed or the prayer life that Jesus had didn't just simply come out of necessity. It came out of a deep longing. It came because his heart is, it was in tune with God. So if you, for example, find it hard to pray, it probably means that you have to wrestle with God and ask God to change your heart. Because a heart that is given to Jesus is a heart that will pray. Because a heart that's given to Jesus is a heart that will long to be with him. And so, the secret of Jesus' ministry is that he pray. Some of us might uh, be sad about many of the things that are happening in our church or even in the world. But many of us who are sad may not be spending enough time praying. Maybe if we prayed, we might see wonders. Who knows? God works wonders when his people join in prayer. We find it all through the Bible. And so when we meditate upon the life of Jesus, perhaps this should encourage us to spend some time in prayer. The last portion of our lesson focuses on a miracle that Jesus did. Yes, after Jesus spent time in prayer, we find like around that time, the disciples go around searching for him, saying that there are some people that are to be healed. And Jesus doesn't mind that, but he says, no, we need to go to other places. So it's interesting the way that Jesus had his healing ministry. He didn't just simply stay in one place. And he didn't just simply heal for the sake of healing. He healed for a purpose. He probably healed so that people will understand that the Messiah has come to bring the good news of his ministry and his sacrifice and his work that he wants to do, his plan of salvation to his people. And so we can clearly see that Jesus... It's not like many of the healers that we might see popular today who ask people to come to them and then they do some kind of prayer or whatever and some people seem to get healed and they're always in large crowds collecting a lot of offering and so on. If they're true healers, I bet that they would be like Jesus. Not caring too much about crowds, but caring about individuals, caring for, for, to have individual experiences and not calling people necessarily to come to him, but going where the people are. This story is about a story of a leper and leprosy is something that probably came from the Near East and uh, Leprosy simply means a dreaded skin disease. Although today we refer to leprosy most uh, to Hansen's disease, but leprosy could mean any, any bad skin disease is leprosy. They do not really know how to differentiate, but this could be uh, the same disease, Hansen's disease that this person was uh, facing, but it could be any other skin ailment also. When you look at the story, we find that the leper asks Jesus to heal him. And he says, if you will, make me clean. And wonderfully, we see that Jesus wills to make this leper clean. And 
this shows how much compassion that how much compassion Jesus had for the people around him, for the people who came for help. And after he heals, he instructs the, he instructs the leper or the former leper to go and offer sacrifice according to the law of Moses. And this appears to be the case that Mark was is trying to paint Jesus as someone who upholds the law of Moses and was not someone who just simply tries to put push the law of Moses aside. Consider how he begins. He begins with Jesus attending the synagogue and not simply doing miracles on the Sabbath uh, on the whim, like as if that's work. So we really see Jesus to be someone who cares about the law that he gave. And so he instructs him to go and show himself to the priest and also instructs him not to tell anyone about what he had done. Although it's a strange request because when someone has done something good for you, you'd always want to announce it, spread the good news so that people will, uh, because you're just happy. But Jesus really wanted this man not to share this happening with anyone. And unfortunately, because this man shared what has happened to him, Jesus' work was hindered and he had to go to other places because of what, uh, what this man did. And so a thing that the lesson tries to point out is that good intentions do not make good actions. There are many things that we might want to do for the gospel. We might want to do for this or that. But is it a good time? Is it a good place? These are some things we need to consider. Will sharing the gospel in one way hinder my progress? Will people misunderstand me if I communicate in this way or that way? These are all good things to consider. And Mark makes us think about that. Finally, when we look at our lesson, let us think about this question. Jesus' entire life was marked by self-denial from the cradle to the cross. Have any one of us or has any one of us embarked yet in a ministry that has demanded too much sacrifice? It's a good question to ask. Have we really endured too much sacrifice? For example, like Paul or even like Jesus, have we endured self-denial at the level of Jesus? That's a question that this portion of Mark is trying to ask us. The disciples left everything and followed Jesus. The demons were too afraid to uh, approach Jesus or challenge Jesus. They just fled away. Jesus dedicated his life to ministering for those who are sick and weak and spent a lot of time with them, but did not compromise on his time with the Father. And he didn't care about fame or name in the sense of becoming popular with people, but he cared about doing what was the mission of his Father. And so he moved from place to place, healing and teaching, so that people will be able to accept the truth that he was wanting to give them. And ultimately, we know that he lived a life of sacrifice. So have you lived the same life? Have you made decisions in a similar way? That's a good question to ask. That's a good question to meditate on. And it's a good question to discuss in each one of our Sabbath School lesson classes. So this will be it for our second lesson. And we hope that God will be able to Bless us and guide us more as we continue to study the Gospels and understand the truth that he has preserved for us. Let us pray. Loving and merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the lessons we learn about Jesus, about his life, and about the way he did his ministry, about how he interacted with the people and the sacrifices he made. We thank you for the disciples willing to give their lives for you even 
sacrificing their own families. May we be able to give all, have the attitude of giving all to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.